Sensory Processing and Church Accessibility. The BSL interpretation of this event was recorded live and for the attendees. It is not a word-for-word -word translation and may contain errors due to the nature of the work for this session. So, uh, now moving on to uh, the main section of our event. Uh, and uh, I've been delighted that uh, we've been able to be uh, connected up with Dr. Naomi Graham, uh, and who is going to be speaking now on this uh, important topic of, of sensory processing and church accessibility. Uh, so Naomi is a children's occupational therapist. Uh, she's the founder and chief executive of the charity Growing Hope. Uh, she's a published author and a speaker uh, and probably many other things as well. Uh, but I'm delighted uh, that uh, she's here with us and it's a privilege to welcome uh, Naomi uh, to share some of her wisdom and insights on this topic. So thank you, Naomi, and over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. It's such a pleasure to be here and to um, be with all of you this morning. I'm just going to share my screen for you so that you can see what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, as Tim said, my name's Nermi, I'm a children's occupational therapist and I founded Growing Hope just over five years ago now. We provide free therapy for children and young people with additional needs in partnership with churches right across the UK. Hopefully it's just going to click on for us. There we go. Um, so when we look at additional needs and what I'm going to talk about today is that additional needs are really wide ranging. We have physical needs, learning needs, mental health needs, undiagnosed needs. The perspective that I'm talking about is that they could be anything that impacts on participation for any individual. So as an occupational therapist, I'm looking at, you know, anyone who walks into our churches, into our communities. We're looking at how we process the world around us through our senses, how we apply that to our church ministry. But what I want to do to start off is to play you a video just to show you who Growing Hope are and what we do, and then we'll jump in. So hopefully this is going to work for us. Growing Hope provides free therapy for children with additional needs in partnership with local churches. Therapy can be instrumental in helping children thrive. However, waiting lists are frustratingly long and private therapy is simply not an option for most families. We aim to bridge the gap between the need and the availability of therapy services. At Growing Hope Local Clinics, we support children with learning, physical, mental health or undiagnosed needs. We help children like Adam, who has autism. Occupational therapy has helped him to focus for longer, get dressed and engage in play with his mum, Regia. Therapy is tailored to the child and can also include physio, speech and language and music therapy or counselling. We want everyone to know that they are seen, heard and belong. We grow hope for families through taking the time to ask parents like Regia how they are and within sessions equipping them with strategies to help at home. Additional needs affects the whole family. Our courses create a safe place for parents and siblings to process their experiences and find new hope. We believe that Jesus brings hope even in the most difficult situations. We share this, asking families if there's anything they'd like to pray about in their sessions, with no pressure if they don't want to. Our clinics are open to individuals of all faiths and backgrounds. We always stop to listen to families, doing our best to stand with them in hard times. I'm not sure how much of that worked for you because of the internet. I'm sorry if it didn't. Um, our trailer video is on our website, growinghope.org.uk. So if you want to watch it, you can and go and look us up. Um, so this morning, I want us to be thinking about how we can choose to see as Jesus sees. So throughout the biblical narrative, we see Jesus constantly taking people from the edges and bringing them into community. 
um, we're enabling people to experience that opportunity to be a part of community. And I don't know how you see people, but one of my challenges um, since I've been younger is just how do I choose to see as Jesus sees? When I was about 12, I was helping with Beaver Scouts. So my my parents, my parents were running a Beaver Scout group in our local community, which my brothers were going to. And I was really excited because a little boy who's a wheelchair was coming along to Beavers. And I was thinking, great, I cannot wait to help him. This is going to be brilliant. Like I can, you know, have a real purpose and really help him to be able to join in. The day arrived, the ramps were ready. He came into the room, he had a power chair. He was, you know, joined in with game time, joined in with hello time. It got to craft time and I really wanted to help. I was desperate to give him the help that, um, you know, I was wanting to give. And I stood opposite him at this table. They were hexagonal tables and I stood opposite him and I took his craft from his place and I started to write his name on it. And he looked up at me and he looked at me right in the eyes and he said, I can write my own name. And in that moment, I felt really ashamed. I, you know, had totally misjudged him for who he was and what he was able to do. I'd made assumptions because he uses a wheelchair, a power chair, and I hadn't seen him for who he was. I hadn't asked him what he needed. And, you know, I think God shows us how we can take off our own glasses and put on his glasses in the way that we see people around us. And understanding sensory processing can really help us with that and helping us be able to understand um, people's perspectives. So funny question I want to throw out there for you. Um, so you can take a moment just to think about this for yourselves. What do you do in your morning routine? Do you, you know, give yourself five minutes, an hour, have a tea, have a coffee, go for a run? I'm going to give you a moment just to think about that and then I'll explain why I'm asking you to think about it. So probably you'll have different things that you do in your morning routines. I mean, definitely. We're, we're not all the same. Um, and for some of us, there are things that we do that help us to be able to feel just right at the start of our day. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever missed your alarm or something's gone wrong at the start of your day and then the rest of your day feels really off. Now, there might be some of you who are like, I must have you know, five minutes of peace and quiet before I start or I must sit and have my cup of coffee or I must go for a run, whatever it is. We do lots of things that subconsciously get our bodies ready and enable us to then do the rest of our day now what happens is often sometimes for individuals with initial needs um or all of us we all have different sensory preferences but sometimes particularly for individuals with initial needs they might not um have an awareness of what things they need in their everyday or kind of when they're accessing environments so if we can be aware of sensory processing and what we need or what other people need that can help us with the way that we do church ministry. So this is a, a diagram for you that shows the way that our central nervous system works. So um, we have our senses right at the bottom and we have academic learning right at the very top. Our senses are foundational to everything that we then are able to do and take in and understand. Um, and that it's really important for us to be aware of our senses. So that's what we're going to focus on. So you have eight senses, uh, your sense of sight, your visual sense, your sense of hearing, your auditory sense, your sense of smell, taste, touch, balance, body awareness, and your internal sense, which is your interceptive sense. So we're going to give this a go um, together to try and have a think about how these senses impact us. 
but we see these all throughout the Bible. So our sense of sight, um, God speaks to us through each of these senses. In Matthew 6, when he's Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount, we see him say, look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? He's using what people see in their environment to enable them to understand what's happening. And obviously, we all have different um, sensory needs. We also may have sensory impairments, which means some of these senses we rely on more and some of them we're not able to use. So the more we're able to use all of these senses, the more we can enable everyone to be able to um, join in with all of these things. So I want us to give it a go with some of these different senses. So with touch, um, we see Jesus throughout the Bible talk to the disciples whilst they're doing things we see God speak to um Isaiah and Jeremiah like as they're actually physically doing things he gives them words that he's saying our sense of touch has an impact on our bodies so if you want you can get your uh, roll your sleeve up if you uh, or um use your arm and you can put your hand just above your skin and if you go at this don't do it if you don't like it but if you go just above your skin it feels like not a very nice feeling. That's alert, um, tickly touch. And then often people rub it out or might hold firmly. That's deep pressure touch. Now with our sense of touch, we know that deep pressure is calming and light tickly touch is alerting. We know that touch is powerful, don't we? We know that, um, you know, Jesus touched people and healed them in the Bible, and um, but we, can be aware of how different touch impacts people if we use a whole hand to help with touch that's going to help people to be able to process touch more easily in my um, ministry at church if I'm going to touch somebody if I'm going to brush past them a whole hand is going to be easier for everyone's brains to process but we can also ask permission and check before we touch people because sometimes people have sensitivity to touch um <clears throat> our balance and our sense of where our body is in space has a really big impact on everything that we do as well if you want if you've got paper in front of you you can give this a go whilst we're um thinking about things this morning you can lift your feet off the floor and get a pen and see if you can write a sentence with your feet off the floor what that does it just gives you an awareness of what you know if you want to make it even harder you can sit even like on the edge of your chair and um, it gives you an awareness of <laughs> how much we use our bodies to be able to do the things that we need to do every day and with our sense of balance I love in the bible you know balance is in our inner ear so it's a sense that's to do with how fast we're moving and the direction that we're moving in in the bible when the disciples are in the storm the storm is absolutely raging and then Jesus says stop be still to the waves now in that moment because of the way god's made our brains there would have been a stop in the vestibular system there would have been a stillness there would have been this real experience not just like cognitively but through their through their senses of wow jesus has just stopped this storm that's going on around us Jesus speaks to us in so many different ways and we have the opportunity to bring that into the way that we teach and enable everyone in our churches to be able to engage in church ministry. So our sense of um, proprioception is, is really important as well. And that's our sense of body awareness. So that's about where our body is in space. So if I put my arm here, I can close my eyes and I can copy it with this arm because I know where my body is. I don't have to look and say, oh, there's my elbow. Okay, how can I make this elbow go here? You have receptors in your joints which send signals to your brain and tell you where your body is positioned in space. Now, we can try something to demonstrate this. Um, don't do it if you've got a shoulder injury. But what you can do, uh, or, or yeah, if, it, if it's um, tricky, then there's no pressure. But you can see if you can get your fingers and touch them above your head without looking. 
So two fingers, see if you can touch them off your head. Easy, tricky, sometimes people miss. Don't worry if you missed. Then what I want you to do is see if you can put um, your two hands together and push them together. I often say, see if you can trap a fly in your hands, you know, not to squish it, but just to push it in between your hands. You could count to 10 and then let it go. Put one hand facing the sky, one hand facing the floor, link your fingers together and then pull them as hard as you can. If you're next to somebody, don't let go and hit them. I'm always worried I'm, I'm gonna cause some injuries when we do this and you can try it the other way up. That's it. And then you can give yourself a big hug. Big squeeze right around your shoulders. And then you can try putting your hands underneath your bottom. This is quite tricky. And then um, facing down on your chair, push up on your hands and lift your feet off the floor. So be, if you're on the sofa, it's going to be too hard. <laughs> but if you're on a hard chair, it might be possible. Um, okay. And then what I'd like you to do is just try this again. So using your two fingers, see if you can touch your fingers above your head. And you can see if it's easier or harder. It technically should be easier. Um, don't worry if it's not. It's just an illustration. Um, but what what's happened is you're all a bit more awake. You're all a bit more looking at me. You're all a bit more engaged. Or for those of you that I can see, you um, hopefully can feel your shoulders and your arms a bit more. That feeling of like, oh, there's my body is a really helpful feeling that helps us to be able to engage in activities. And that's why when you do something like walk and talk with somebody, you um, it's easier to listen. When you've been to the gym, it's easier to concentrate. If you're driving in the car and chewing gum, um, our mouth can be a good way of getting this body awareness, proprioceptive input, it's easier to engage. So when we see Jesus like walking and talking with the disciples, and they're engaging with him. Again, it's another way that they can hear God's voice. Now, I realized I skipped a, a, a couple earlier. In terms of our hearing, um, we see God say, the sheep hear my voice. Now, we hear God's voice in lots of different ways, don't we? But we know that either through um, that visual input or through speaking, we can communicate something of God and we can also hear what God is saying we can hear him in so many different ways through our bodies our sense of smell our olfactory sense is really closely linked to our memory so what I'd like you to do if you'd like to for a second is close your eyes see if you can think of a smell that's linked to a really happy memory for you you can hopefully you can think of one so the reason that you can think of that, you can open your eyes now. The reason that hopefully people have one, you can think of a smell that's linked to a memory is because of the way our brains work, the way, the amazing way that God has made our brains links our sense of smell and our memory. And I love that in the Bible, there are lots of different smells. There are lots of different moments where God might speak to people through smells. So if we think about that moment where, um, the woman pours the perfume on Jesus' feet. It says the whole house was filled with the smell of perfume. And that um, God really spoke through that moment about Jesus' death and resurrection and him coming back. But also fish was a really normal part of those diets in those times. And fish is pretty strong smelling, isn't it? I don't particularly like fish. But if we think about the feeding of the 5,000, I'm pretty sure it will have smelled of fish, but that was an incredible miracle. Like Jesus's provision, God's provision in that moment was amazing. Now, for me, we don't know, but I wonder if because of the way our brains are made, every time those individuals then had their fish for supper or, um, you know, walked past that fish, maybe that smell reminded them of, wow, that's what Jesus did for us. He provided that food for us when we were on that mountain. We see that God says, taste and see that the Lord is good in the Psalms, don't we? We know that we can know God's goodness, um, not just in our heads, but like through our bodies and through what we're tasting as well. Jesus's touch has the power to heal 
the women who have been bleeding. We know that touch has a massive impact on us in terms of attachment and processing. And, you know, I mean, there's so much we could talk about in terms of that. But touch and safe touch is really, really important for our well-being. And we talked about how a whole hand can be better than like light tickly touch. And then we have our internal sense, our sense of interoception. That is about the kind of internal sense in my body, in my organs that tells me if I'm sick, if I'm hungry, if I need the toilet. I think that's sometimes where we feel that sense of stillness um, and we feel God speaking to us through that sense. Now, I want to just tell you a quick story before I go on to this. I'm um, so there's a little girl who I worked with when it, she actually through New Wine Summer Conferences when she was 14 and she couldn't walk or talk or sit by herself. And yet she carried the most amazing sense of God's presence with her wherever she went. Um, when you spent time with her, it was like she carried this kind of, and I can only describe it through this like interceptive thing, sense of, of being with God that enabled others to experience that and she really sadly died when she was 14 but at her funeral person after person after person got up and they said I know more of God because I spent time with we'll call her Abby and for me I've a few slides later I've got a reference to my book I've written a book called Love Surpassing Knowledge which is all about this but Abby's story is one that um helped me think about this that like our relationship with Jesus isn't just about knowledge and about what we can explain. It's about that that relationship that is so much more that surpasses knowledge. Um, and yeah, that's why I wrote it, because I want us to to have the, you know, the things that I know about the brain as an occupational therapist, together with how God speaks to us in the Bible, together with how we practically apply that to our church ministry, gives us so much opportunity to enable people to um, be released in their gifting and in, in being kingdom and that to enable us to be churches, which are spaces of belonging. I'm just going to show you this slide, but I've also sent the slides to be sent out as well. Um, so this is different ways with each of these senses that you can do activities which are calming or alerting. But what I'd love you to do is think about um, movement. So movement is our best, um, engine changer it's the best way to help our bodies feel more calm if you've got someone in your church who is like lethargic zoned out can't concentrate or someone who's bouncing off the walls really finding it hard to settle the more movement we do the more we help everybody get back to a just right level um is what we call it in ot but a level where they can engage so if you can be doing movement activities in between stuff, if you can just have a basket of pipe cleaners at the door when people come in to church, that gives people something in their hands to help them concentrate. If you could have a crunchy snack in the middle of church, some carrot sticks, some apple, um, a movement, a chance to move, to give yourself a big hug to think about God's love, you're going to enable more people to join in. We know that sensory sensitivity um, it, like, can impact lots of people. Um, it can be like a Coke bottle. The more we have different sensory experiences throughout the day, that can enable explosion. But the more we do regulating things, the more it helps people to feel calm um, and regulated. Um, I wanted to just tell you, I'm, I'm going to stop in a second because I know I'm a couple of minutes over my time. Um, a couple of things that we do at Growing Hope which are really important for the whole family so we have a siblings group which is for brothers and sisters of children with additional needs we train anyone to become a facilitator no experience needed it's a counseling based group runs for seven weeks we give you all the resources you need puppets that kind of thing to support brothers and sisters because we know that mental health needs for families of children and young people with additional needs and adults are on the increase and often much higher than in the rest of the population. So you can train to do this, local schools love it. You can say to a school, we'd love to run this for free um, in your local school. So you can do that. And then our When Dreams Change course, we also train facilitators to run this. 
It's a four week course for parents and carers based on the story of Joseph. We look at the grief cycle, how we fill up our own cup to give to our children, who's in our support networks and how we um, yeah, we then enable parents and carers to connect with each other. And again, um, really good course you can run in your church or in your school, links people in together. Um, and then this is how you do it. So you can follow that um, QR code if you want to, that takes you to the information about the training, or you can email my colleague, Vicky. Um, the course costs, it's around 450 pounds to train two people or um, 200 pounds ish to train 200 to 300, one person training in London. So you could facilitate that course for families of additional children with additional needs. Um, this is my book. You can get it online at growing hope forward slash books. Um, but yeah, that is everything that I wanted to share with you this morning. Hopefully that was helpful for you. Okay, brilliant. I think everyone is coming back in from the breakout rooms now. Um, so we hope you found that discussion helpful and we'd love you to support to support you a bit more now to put um, things into practice. Um, so we've just um, prepared a few starter questions and then hopefully we'll be able to share some items from um, the chat as well. Um, if there's anything we don't get to today, um, we're going to take a copy of the, um, the chat uh, as it stands at the moment um, at the end of the session and we'll try to pick out some key themes and share that with you after the event. Um, but with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Jess, who's going to give um, the first question to Naomi. Thanks, Jess. Hey, hello. Um, just want to say it was great feedback, uh, great breakout rooms. So thank you, everybody, for sharing. Um, but Naomi, we were just wondering, as our first question, um, when we begin to facilitate groups and we have a, a broad range of people um, with different needs or perhaps sometimes conflicting needs um, that need to use the uh, same space how do we manage that how would we go about facilitating that yeah amazing question Jess thank you so much um so what I wanted to do is quickly run through the different senses and the practical things you can do for each of those senses and how that can help meet different well, needs what's happened we'll just are we everyone okay Great. Um, so I'm going to run through the different senses and what's, um, yeah, what helps each of them. But I think the key thing to remember in ter just in terms of sensory processing is that what the thing that we talked about, about proprioception and movement activity. So any movement activity we do that puts pressure through our joints helps us feel more calm if we're dysregulated because we're kind of overactive and more um, more just right, more able to listen if we're um, like under under um, arousal and not able to, to focus. And we, you know, whatever our needs are, even if Sorry. we're somebody Went on to who has a physical disability, um, you know, there's still ways that we can we can help somebody have a hug to get that input to help their brain be more active or we can you know still sit somebody on a gym board to help them have that input um but if I just run through the senses so our sense of sight our visual sense things that can be really helpful are um like flashy things are alerting plain things are calming I always make sure if I'm teaching anybody I'm I have my back to a, a plain background so if I'm in my clinic my back will always be against a white wall because I want to be the most exciting thing that people are looking at and we can apply that to everything we're doing if we think about individuals with autism often um visual perception is a really strong skill I once ages ago saw a where's Wally um a documentary where there was a where's Wally that was like massive a whole wall and adults with autism found Wally in like 30 seconds adults without autism found Wally in like 10 minutes or something um just an illustration and you know not a kind of necessarily replicable thing but actually if we know that visual skills are a strength um we can be thinking about how we use that so using visual stuff 
always like I'd always recommend to, to church leaders to be using visuals to be using um objects because that helps everybody helps us to know you know visual schedules also so important you know using those symbols that everyone's aware of what's happening when it's going to happen I use that in my clinic for my children but I use it in my clinic also because I then know what I'm doing and what I'm supposed to be following and actually that helps everybody feel more safe and secure um but that thing with visual stuff if I have autism and I'm distracted by visual information if I sit somebody with autism at the back of a congregation or at the back of kids ministry actually there is so much visual distraction between them and me at the front or whoever it is at the front so I can think, OK, maybe they could sit at the side near the front, because I know that if they're in the middle at the front, the crowd might be too overwhelming. But at the side at the front, they can see me. I'm the most interesting thing. But there isn't too much um, going on that's going to be distracting. So that's visual and um, hearing. Um, we in terms of hearing sensitivity, ear defenders can be super helpful. So lots of people have auditory sensitivity, ear defenders, earplugs can work really well. Um, I'd always have them in a basket at the back of church. Anyone can borrow them if they want them. Not just, you know, there are, there's all times when we have different needs. And I should be saying that anyway. The table that I showed you, the preferences we're talking about, we all have individual preferences. There'll be times where you find some things harder, some things easier. There's times when it feels like the volume's turned up if you're feeling ill or stressed or um, having a bad day. Sometimes for all of your senses, it feels like the volume's turned up. So if you're sensitive to touch and you're having a bad day, you might be more and more sensitive to touch um, on that day because of it. it's like the volume turned up. So also in terms of our hearing, we know that rhythmic steady calm things are kind of regulating for us and anything changing in pitch and tempo is going to be alerting so if I'm trying to get everybody in the room to listen to me and I'm starting to feel stress everyone is feeling a bit overactive if I'm saying okay Johnny come and sit down like Johnny come sit down over here have you heard me come and sit down over here um in lots of different ways that's not very great because I'm giving loads of information but it's very alerting and like freezing the tension in the room whereas if I say Johnny sitting I mean I'm signing as well and showing him where to sit but I'm just giving one command two words very clear if I lower my voice and bring it down I actually help people to lean in to engage I'm slowing down I'm helping people feel more calm as I'm speaking to them I whenever I'm teaching in kids youth and um, often sometimes adult ministry I'll have a box or a bag something that people can't see into that I will pull objects out of to help people to look at and engage with the story so that's I can then give them something to touch or I might do a talk where I've often talked about Zacchaeus where Jesus sees Zacchaeus welcomes him down the tree and actually everyone then um he's showing the community that everybody is welcome but I give everybody a stick and I often make that stick smell by dipping it into a candle of fig scented candle because he climbs a sycamore tree fig sycamore tree um but that object in their hands then enables them to take something home which enables them to remember about how God speaks to them um smell I had a teacher once say to me um that they had a child who couldn't go into a classroom because of the smell of the classroom and they put strawberry Vaseline on her nose so that she could then um successfully enter into the classroom um, and we know like smell is linked to memory, like we were saying, you can use different smells to help people to engage in the, the um, stories and the things that you're sharing. Um, taste, we can give people, again, taste the things, help them engage. Um, crunchy snacks are really, really good. I often, in my particular kids, I'll give them a crunchy snack whilst I'm telling the story because that gives that movement input, helps everybody, whether they are struggling to engage because they're too fast or struggling to engage because they're too slow and a bit lethargic to concentrate. I had a group with children with autism and ADHD and they 
Um, we did a lot of movement around the room to start with to help get us regulated. But then what I do is I'd sit them at the table, I'd give them all an apple and I'd say, okay, who can have the biggest bite of their apple? And um, I knew I then had a few minutes to, to give them some input whilst they were busy chewing. <laughs> um, and then our sense of um, touch. So we know having objects can really help us. I don't know how many of you fiddle, but things like pipe cleaners, super easy fidget for people to have in their hands. I always say the rule with fidgets is this is to help you concentrate. If you throw it or use it not to help you concentrate, I'm going to take it away. But otherwise, that's what it's there for. Um, balance and movement. So the more movement we do to engage everyone, the more um, everyone's going to be able to engage in activities. Um, I know that was a lot of information, but it's because I didn't get to say it earlier. So I thought I'd throw it in to help answer the question. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you, Naomi. Um, we've got a couple of questions here as well uh, from our group. Um, and I'd just like to say to people, uh, pop your questions or your feedback in the chat for us. Um, but just going to your fidget spinners there, Naomi, we did have someone ask, should we give fidget toys to children for the whole of the session? Um, because they're asking, would that distract them? Um, and would it possibly cause any jealousy or arguments over who gets what? Great question. I always, so um, of, people often ask this question to me like, oh, but if I give someone a wobble cushion, so a wobble cushion, circular cushion, fill with a bit of air, gives you the chance to wiggle your bottom whilst you're sitting still, brilliant, works really well. If I give someone um, one of those, will, it, will not all the other children be like, oh, but why don't I get one? Often children might want to try it like once, but once they have, they're generally fine. And also if you use the explanation, I often say like, just like I need glasses to help me see, um, Tommy needs this cushion to help him concentrate. And kids are like, oh, okay, great. Children are very accepting um, often <laughs> compared to us. But um, with fidgets, I think they're, help they're not just helpful if you have additional needs, they're helpful for everybody. I don't know how many of you doodle. I doodle or have things in my hands often all the time. And actually, that's helping our, it's helping your body get to a level where you can focus. Um, so, I mean, you don't need it during craft time necessarily or a game time or whatever. But if you're, I would normally give the option for everyone to have a pipe cleaner. It's a great thing about pipe cleaners as well, because they're the same um, during the like story time or, or just have a box of fidgets where they can, they can choose if they want them. Yeah, well, we have, um, I've been looking at some of the themes. Thank you so much, Naomi. And I think in our group, we kind of really, um, I guess, embraced a lot of what you were saying earlier. And I think people were kind of still chewing it over <laughs> and kind of thinking about how they can relate that to, to what they're doing within their church. And um, just by looking at some of the, the chat and some of the areas there, um, one of the themes um, that was quite common was that people were really kind of excited about um, the whole kind of sensory um, process and, and, and being aware of it, but, but actually being able to, to have it as a framework within the church. So not specifically, of, of course, obviously, if people come with additional needs, you can use that and, and kind of work with that. Um, as an individual kind of framework for them, but but actually try to implement it as a framework so that even you know, people are, yeah, people who um, may be struggling and not, you know, wanting to say, they can still feel included. Um, but also um, for people who are undiagnosed, I think that came up quite a lot, that there are adult children that may not be diagnosed. So then therefore, you know, that, you know, ensuring that they're also, um, part of um, the church family too so and then there were some other areas that people felt that um you know for instance people had frameworks already in place go curriculum was one of them that they felt was really kind of helpful within their church um and others um felt like um the sensory breakout rooms that they had things like that um that they felt were um helpful um but then um we also looked at you know although sound is good and thinking about different sounds but also having silence you know just being able to to have that as part of 
of, um, you know, because people tend to think that you always need noise, but silence can also create something that's quite special for people. Um, but again, um, we all, um, I think most of, of what I've been seeing as a theme is that it's about having an awareness. So really being able to digest that awareness and, and think of ways that we can implement that into our church families. Because like you said, you know, people are different, you know, cultures, the different types of worship um, frameworks, um, it's different. So it's what fits within your church family. It might be that, you, you know, you kind of work with different things to see what, you know, but at least you've given so many different examples that people can use and fit into their own frameworks. Um, so I hope that that's kind of everything. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that, but yeah. I thought that, that was quite important. Yeah, that that's totally Brenda. And I think, um, yeah, there was so much I was trying to squeeze into that, which uh, if anyone wants more, we do a Scrang Hope training for churches around sensory processing and all this kind of thing. So do get in touch if you want us to come and do that in your church in more depth and also in my book in terms of session plans and stuff there are session plans in the appendix which give you like really practical okay here are the things you need for this multi-sensory story here are the movement activities you can do in this session um for both children and youth and adult groups so there's lots of ideas for that in my book but also absolutely it's all about change you know and I'm I, sorry I didn't communicate that well. Throughout the biblical narrative, we see Jesus drawing people from the edges of community into the center. And I think that is absolutely what we should be doing as church. Like we are, we need to be creating places for everyone, not just saying, you know, Jesus at never at any point says, oh, oh no, like women by the well, no, you need to stay over there on your own and do your own thing because you're a bit different to everybody else over here he's saying no come on in like come into community so if we can make changes for everyone that make a difference for the way that everyone can join in like in in my opinion that's the way we should be doing church so having all these things in place you know our fidgets that everyone can use our ear defenders that everyone can use our um you know quieter space that isn't as loud that where the speakers are off so that if you need a bit of space you can go and sit there because we all have different times and we have different needs and different things that are going on you know visuals that are really helpful a slide at the start of church which tells people what's going to happen um the visual schedule at the beginning of kids ministry all of those things you know movement stuff within within everything we're doing help everyone to be able to join in and um, I meant to say as well, I've just remembered I was going to say about attachment stuff. So um, a lot of this sensory processing stuff also links to attachment and trauma. Um, so I've also done some training in sensory attachment intervention. One of the key takeaways from that is that co-regulation is really important. So between um, an individual who has experienced trauma, and we know that that has a really big impact on brain um how our brains are made up and how we process our senses. So the most kind of regulating thing for individuals with trauma is something called co-regulation. And you can do that through those movement activities, but movement activities with a significant adult. So that might be sharing a crunchy snack, that might be doing a tug of war, that might be um, sitting on a gym ball while, or trying to climb on a gym ball while the adult holds your hand. So something where both of you can do it together. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Naomi. Um... For more from Naomi and Growing Hope, visit www.growinghope.org.uk. Find out about Through the Roof at www.throughtheroof.org.uk.